Good evening, everyone. I'm Sarah Coffin. I'm head of the Product Design and Decorative Arts Department here at Cooper Hewitt. And I had the great pleasure of working with Ted Muling to curate the Loebmeyer exhibition that is on upstairs. I also had the great pleasure of going to Vienna, looking through the archives, and researching it while uh, working on the acquisition of most of it uh, that we acquired a couple of years ago. But the, one of the exciting things that happened as part of this exhibition is that we've had the great fortune to have two lectures sponsored by the Austrian Cultural Forum and uh, Thomas Geisler, who is here with us tonight as the second of those. We were very excited to hear uh, that Thomas was available uh, even before he became the curator of uh, at MAC, which is known as the muse what the Museum of Applied Arts is known as, as the uh, chief design curator, because already we had had some access to his work because we featured a presentation on Vienna Design Week uh, for this year at the beginning of the exhibition. Tomas was one of the founding co-directors of that uh, Vienna Design Week, which has gone on now uh, for four years uh, in Vienna. Prior to that, and concurrently, he was a lecturer and senior scientist at the uh, Mach Applied Arts uh, Institute of Design. The list of exhibitions that he's worked on is so long that uh, you won't get to hear him if I even begin to describe it. But one of the things that gives me particular pleasure uh, in introducing him to speak on, on this topic is that he has been a designer for furniture, interiors, exhibitions, and a graphic designer. This really runs the full gamut of exactly what Cooper Hewitt has in its collection and can approach uh, these, this topic both as a designer and as a curator and as a, an exhibition maker. So I look very forward very much to hearing what he has to say and welcome Tomas. Yeah, thank you, uh, Sarah Coffin, for this uh, welcome. And uh, thanks uh, to the uh, Austrian Cultural Forum to having me here over to the Cooper U National Design Museum. Uh, on this uh, very special exhibition about uh, exquisite Lobmeyer glass uh, curated by Ted Mühling. That's the way how you say it here. We would say Mühling. <laughs> um, well, I was uh, invited to um, frame this exhibition, or this is actually how I see my presentation or my, uh, uh, my talk, how to frame a company like Lobmeyer as a sort of a energy energy for contemporary design already since the 19th century so even if you if we see a lot of historical people uh, uh, pieces upstairs Lobmeyer always has been uh, an innovator and so does uh, uh, Lobmeyer today today and the youngest generation of uh, the Rat family who actually leads uh, lead the company. So what I'm trying to do, uh, the title of my presentation is From Imperial to Contemporary, a rediscovery of traditional Austrian crafts and manufacturing. So I'd like to talk about you know, the shifts from imperial to contemporary, also in terms of a history, not just a design history, but also uh, social, a cultural, and economic, and political history in Austria that certainly um, 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 created or formed uh, an Austrian design uh, history or identity. Uh, I will give you a sh sort of a crash course in, in Austrian design history because I think it will give you also a good framing for um, the Loebmeyer um, <coughs> exhibition or uh, their uh, work in glass uh, to see it uh, next to others, see it with uh, protagonists and examples uh, of their time. Uh, at the, at uh, the later part, I'd like to uh, show you some of the projects that we do within Vienna Design Week that I founded uh, in 2006 together with two colleagues, uh, Lili Hollein and, and Tulga uh, Bayerle. Um, 
we created this annual design festival uh, for good reasons, because there was nothing similar like this in Vienna. And Vienna has been off uh, the design tracks for, I think, too long as well. Um, Vienna has been famous for its design contributions uh, around 1900 and maybe later on in this, the radical 60s, but uh, contemporarily uh, there is a lot going on and we tried not just uh, to bring in international people, but also to um, create a platform for the actual design scene in Vienna uh, to present themselves and uh, work on projects. And in particular within Vienna Design Week, we have a special focus on local uh, traditional manufacturers that we call, uh, it's a format that we name Passionswege, which is hardly um, to translate because it's not just about passion, uh, both uh, the manufacturer and designer, but also the people interested in design have to have passion to follow all these tracks. Uh, during the festival, before the festival and after the festival, it of course also deals with a very sort of typical Viennese Austrian cultural background. Well, um, so um, also the foundation of Lobmeyer Glass goes back as far as 1823. My main focus of a brief review to Austrian design history will be the 20th century up to present times. Also because ever since the late 19th century, the close relation between the handcrafted or manufactured and the industrial produced has been evident. For, uh, if not a source or marker for an Austrian approach in design, whether in a progressive, a reformist or a reactionist manner. The, last, uh, the past, let's say roughly 150 years of Austria's history that we are overlooking now, marked by political, economic and social ruptures and restructuring, provides the backdrop for the present depiction of how Austrian design culture has developed and has created a unique design landschaft or design landscape uh, a term my dear colleague and co-founder of Vienna Design Week, Tulga Beile, has coined in her fundamental publication, A Century of Austrian Design. Within this time period, Austria was initially a powerful empire, succeeded by a duel, the Austrian-Hungarian monarchy, that strove for inner harmony since 1867, looking back on a much longer eventful imperial history of the Habsburg dynasty. Um, the images that I show are much more of an illustration of what I say, but uh, once in a while I certainly will also uh, comment on them. Um, just to give you, I, do, I didn't put any captures to them, uh, so if anything is unclear to you, please uh, raise your hands and ask questions. <coughs> Following World War I, it was reduced to a truncated state believed to have little chance for survival, and consequently it whipped itself out in conflicts between the three camps, social democratics, Catholic conservative, and German nationalist. Prior to and in course of the Anschluss, the annexation with Nazi, Nazi, of Nazi Germany, Austria suffered a drain of its intellectual, creative, and economic potential, which would never be regained. By 1945, the country had slipped to the bottom third on the European welfare scale in economic terms. The population, similar to the situation after World War I, was on the brink of starvation. Up only upon the ratification of the state treaty in 1955, after seven years of Nazi dictatorship and 10 years of allied occupation, Austria was reappointed total independence and sovereignty and could develop a census-based national identity, or at least created one. Thanks to the US support within the Marshall Plan framework, the country was able to rapidly 
build a stable, flourishing economy. Today, Austria, a European Union member since 1995, is among the richest countries on earth. And according to a recent EU-wide, European Union-wide community in, uh, innovation survey, is above the European average in terms of achievements in innovation, profit shares for new products, market innovations, and patent registrations. Also, or because now primarily, small and mid-sized industries form the country's economic backbone. It was much more difficult for Austria than for other in, uh, industrial nations to position itself as a design nation due to its eventful history. The traumatic ruptures alluded to here and the national identity forming process, which occurred only much later and remained shaped by collective repression and a lack of self-confidence for quite some time. Certainly, the new positioning or repositioning, as we can see here on the map, uh, in the heart of Europe, the now open borders to the east since 1989, give the country a geographical advantage and a boost of attention at the beginning of the 21st century. After having been neglected, except by winter tourists and nostalgi nostalgics, in the post-war era as an outpost during the Cold War years, or more recent, in the aftermath of a media hyped reawakening of nationalist extremes within Austria's population. By now, a development in the course of unresolved socio-political matters that all societies confronted with. However, all of these created a certain melange of image of Austria, its culture and its material world, more or less intended. Framed in the pictures that derive from such film classics like The Third Man with Orson, uh, oh, sorry, that, that was one thing I wanted to uh, point out. Um, that was a supplement to the Süddeutsche uh, newspaper. And um, also you can't read it, but it's in German anyway. It was subtitled, What do you think of a country that looks like a Wiener Schnitzel? <laughs> And it was uh, in reference to uh, what was going on at the time uh, with uh, Haider and uh, the uh, coalition. So, um, yeah, as I said, all of this created interesting, uh, an interesting melange of images uh, added by other um, cultural markers or uh, events like the films uh, I mentioned, The Third Man uh, with Orson Welles or Ernst Marischka's uh, Sissy trilogy, The Sound of Music uh, starring Julie Andrews, Christopher Plummer and Nicholas Hammond or the more avant-garde movies of Michael Haneke. Not to mention the Im imaginative power of the great variety of literature and music created by Austrian, Austrians and non-Austrians at home or abroad. Uh, in light of this very briefly uh, outlined industrial, economic, social and cultural history, it is that much more remarkable that Austria continuously succeeded in occupying market niches, like good coffee, producing internationally successful innovations and design solutions, and helping shape major cultural movements. Let me give you a few examples or milestones of Austrian design history to illustrate the formation of an Austrian design landscape and its emerging industry. In this particular context of the Lobmeyer exhibition, I will make a special focus on its heritage in the traditional craftsmanship. It also might help to frame 
the outstanding position of the Loebmeyer firm within the trajectory of design innovation in Austria over the past two centuries. The journey uh, through Austria's design landscape might begin in 1859 when My Michael Tonnet or Michael Tonnet launched his model number 14 onto the market. This bandwood chair was one of the first industrially manufactured consumer goods, long before design had become a generally acknowledged concept. Tonnet number, 14, Tonnet number 14's success must be seen against the backdrop of the Habsburg monarchy and its economic interest. After all, it was Prince Metternich the clever statesman to the court of Emperor Francis II and later Ferdinand I, who allured Tonnet with tax reduction and other benefits to move from Boppert am Rhein in Germany to Vienna. The monarchy not only had large amount of raw materials and labor available, but also a vast domestic market within its borders. At the same time, the modern metropolis was de developing, railways were being built, and trade agreements were being made, all beneficial conditions for international export. The big city and its living conditions not only created a new need for in inexpensive mass-produced products, but also changed the way that citizens defined themselves. From products that distinguished the nobility from the established, establishing bourgeoisie to basic con uh, uh, commodities for a legion of low incomers of a growing working class. Themes such as individu individuality, mobility, or logistics achieved a pre uh, previously unknown significance. An emerging, uh, no, um, Otto Wagner was one of the first um, architects to embrace technological achievements. The use of industrial manufactured methods and new materials such as aluminum, here just uh, a few buildings of the um, Stadtbahn that he has established, uh, that he has built uh, in the late uh, 19th century, and of course, what you see as a grid, uh, he, uh, here I have a pointer. Uh, this is actually the former Stadtbahn, and it still creates one of the uh, important uh, tracks of uh, Vienna's uh, metro system. Um, yes, he was um, interested in new materials, and uh, as an urban planner and designer entrusted with Viennese city railway uh, uh, and entrusted with Viennese city railways, he was crucial in shaping the city's image and making it a place of pilgrimage for people interested in modern architecture. As we can see here, Postsparkasse built in 1904 till 06, interiors and uh, the front. Uh, infrastructure, as mentioned before, and hospital environments, uh, another uh, big commission at the time for him was um, the so-called hospital Amsteinhof, today it's called Otto Wagner Spital, uh, with uh, one of the most modern and progressive health and uh, methods, and also in terms of architectural um, trans uh, transformation. An emerging modern and wealthy fin de siècle bourgeoisie naturally, naturally sought possibilities to express its, life, uh, its lifestyle. The rejecting, in rejecting traditional social norms and to distinguish from an overloaded aristocratic pomp of historism or superficial Biedermeier as preferred by the Habsburg, the design of one's private surrounding, uh, surroundings soon became a suitable space in which to clarify this new attitude towards life. 
In accordance with this atmosphere of awakening, reform movements developed throughout Europe. The arts and craft movement in England, uh, the Wiener Werkstätte in Austria, founded in 1903 by Joseph Hoffmann, Kohlemann Moser, and Fritz Werndorfer. New art associations, such as the Secession in Vienna, were established and artist colonies arose all over, for example, at Mathildenhöhe in Darmstadt, Germany, celebrating the idea of the Gesamtkunstwerk of art, architecture, and design. Yeah, here you see the founding uh, members of the Secession, amongst them um, yeah, Klimt, Kolomose, um, and others. Uh, the building uh, established in 1898 by uh, Josef Maria Olbricht and uh, to the top left, uh, Beethoven Fries uh, of Gustav Klimt inside of it. At about the same time, Adolf Loos criticized unintentional design for design's sake and the artificial staged world mainly as it was played out in the private realm. This made him the arch rival of the Wiener Werkstätte the secessionists and its founders. Nonetheless, uh, Loos made a vehement appeal for the recognition of handicrafts because, in his opinion, uh, the proven anonymous artifact met the needs of modern society much better than the perfect Gesamtkunstwerk. More of a co cosmopolitan than a Viennese type, he promoted the freedom of the individual and aimed to be a helper rather than a spokesperson in matters of taste. However, his polemic lectures and articles, such as The Ornament and Crime of 1908, caused an ongoing debate on substance and style within the design and architecture community over the past century in Vienna and abroad. Um, what we can see here is the interior that he uh, built in 1908 for the um, at the uh, at the time called Kärntner Bar um, and later on American Bar. Here is uh, the Lobmeyer drinking set tumblers he did uh, just later in the 1920s interior of the Villa Müller and uh, Ruth, you might know this, <laughs> it's Villa Steiner uh, sections and uh, the facade to the back, back front. How much Laws criticized Joseph Hoffman, Gustav Klimt, and their companions, the Wiener Werkstätte can be credited uh, can be credited with being the first Austrian company that, to establish a trademark associated with utterly sophisticated arts and crafts and sensual design. Also financial, also, financial success remained out of reach. The Wiener Werkstätte business partners were, at the same time, their patrons, buyers, and clients. And like an incestuous system, it had very little chance to survive, especially in the economical shaken interwar years and the Great Depression following 1929. However, Joseph Hoffmann and the Wiener Werkstätte uh, Wiener Werkstätten artists like Dagobert Peche, uh, Michael Powolny, Wally Wieseltier and others overcame historism, ushering in a new design era that reached out far beyond Vienna. The concept of bringing together creative and artistic minds with highly skilled craftspeople ever since has become a part of the DNA of Austria's traditional manufacturers and design. 
These accomplishments were not only recognized with the greatest respect at numerous exhibitions. Uh, just maybe to uh, point out some of the objects here, the case or the box of Coleman Moser, uh, cutlery, Joseph Hoffman, designed for the uh, Silver Werkstatt or was produced by the Silver Werkstatt. Of course, everything was uh, produced for Wiener Werkstätte, some of the shop interiors, and uh, the drinking set Joseph Hoffman did for um, Loebmeier, the black uh, bronze uh, variations called. Um, Uh, these accomplishments were not only recognized with the greatest respect at numerous exhibitions, um, like um, like the one uh, 1989 at Kunstschau in Vienna, where uh, Joseph Hoffmann as well uh, built the pavilion. They also served brilliantly as identification for a post-war Austria and Vienna and gained further promotion after the 1984 exhibition Traum und Wirklichkeit, Dream and Reality, designed by Hans Hollein, uh, which took place at the Künstlerhaus in Vienna. And you see images uh, from the, that exhibition in the, on the bottom. The same exhibition, uh, or the moved on uh, to New York in 1986 and titled Vienna 1900 Architecture and Design uh, was shown at the Museum of Modern Art here in New York. At the end of an ancient monarchy, birth of a new culture, one could read as a headline in an accompanying brochure. Even though in the decade that followed the liquidation in 1932, the Wiener Werkstätten designs remained rather unconsidered and only in the second half of the second, uh, 20th century and due to such events like these exhibitions um, have been rediscovered as collectors items and tastemakers for a middle class concerns concerned with traditional values. In that sense, the Wiener Werkstätte also became kind of a burden for a generation of young Austrian designers, weakening a more general interest and investment in contemporary design and preventing them from taking off the overwhelming shadows of their predecessors. Joseph Hoffman was not uh, Joseph Hoffmann was not only a founder of uh, Wiener Werkstätten and a member of the secession, but also a co-founder of the Austrian Werkbund established in 1913, a coalition based on the German model founded by Peter Behrens of architects, designers, with manufacturers and industrialists interested in bringing together art and industry. We can see their first presentation is here on 1914 uh, at the Werkbund Ausstellung in Cologne. Um, amongst the supporters, uh, the late uh, was the late Ludwig Lodmeier, uh, son of Joseph, the founder of the company. He was a driving force in that in Davies. By then, Ludwig always already had built a closer partnership with the Imperial and Royal Austrian Museum of Art and Industry, today's Museum of Applied Arts, Contemporary Arts, whose foundation in 1863 he significantly supported and whose infrastructure, such as the attached Kunstgewerbeschule, uh, he made use of for developing new products and co collaborations with established professors and students. Um, yeah, here an image of Ludwig Lobmeier and uh, designs he did 
in the around 1870, this piece uh, I've seen upstairs in the exhibition, 1987, a drinking set, um, and uh, a plaque that you're going to find when you go to the Museum of Applied Arts in Vienna, where, uh, which is dedicated, as it says, to the old master of Austrian art glass industry. Ludwig died uh, childless in 1917, and his nephew Stefan Rath, trained at the Kunstgewerbeschule, took over the business, and besides his own artistic and technological knowledge, brought in a valuable network to contemporary artists, architects, and designers. Here an image uh, of his together with Hans Ankwitz Klehoven, who was a uh, the design curator or the curator at the Museum of uh, Art and Industry at the time. The image itself is from the 50s. When, when Stefan Rath had become the sole owner of the company, he applied with a sense of obligation towards an old and glorious tradition all energy to the creation of a new, uh, uh, all energy to the creation of new products this cor that corresponded to a modern sense of form, stated art historian Robert Schmidt in his 1925 publication "A Hundred Years of Austrian Class History." Always by then, Lobmeyer Company and Class work has gained international reputation during the 19th century built up on numerous participations in world fairs and exhibitions throughout Europe, some of them awarded with gold medals and other honors, and uh, finally as well become purveyor to the court. However, most of the admiration went to their excellent skilled work rather than their styles. Again in Paris, uh, at the time uh, the World Fair in 1900, G. and L. Loebmeyer proved themselves to be true adherents to the old tradition, always excellent in each and everything, even if one shape or another, one decoration or another may be called outdated. The solid, good workmanship still warrants that these pieces will always have their value, as stated by a critical contemporary observer. In retrospect, uh, a quote of Stefan Rath makes clear the position of the company towards timely fashion. For that whole secession style, the preferred vogue of the time, was, as it soon turned out, a quickly passing phenomenon. It, in real works of applied art, though, pure purpose and form play such an overriding role that artificialities and unpractical liberties are soon discarded again. This careful and anticipatory consideration, still in the mindset of the current generation of the Rad family, led at the beginning of the 20th century to the most fruitful collaborations with two architects and professors of Stefan Rath at the Kunstgewerbeschule, Josef Hoffmann and Oswald Strinnert. In the company's records is stated Having won Joseph Hoffman for glass was one of the most important deeds of Stefan Rath. It was particular, particularly in designing a material as demanding as crystal that Hoffman proved to be the innovator he actually was, states Hans Harald Rath uh, uh, in 1962 about his father and the importance of Joseph Hoffman's uh, of, of jo Joseph Hoffman for the company's development. Oskar Strinnert, uh, a well-known architect, interior designer, and stage designer in Vienna, was the other close collaborator in that era of Stefan Rath's positioning of the company at the forefront of leading glass manufacturers in Europe. Hans Harald Rath pointed out, crucial for our entire further work was the relationship with our unforgettable Oskar Strinnert, 
were indebted to him, indebted to him for the designs for cut boxes and centerpieces, later for entire services with very original floral goblets. To me, even more important for our work were his clear insights and his objective, always positive critique. That also gives a clear picture of the basis of collaboration and relation between a manufacturer and his designers, which re reaches far beyond the mere design of an object, but asks for a profound examination, exchange, and respect of each other, which is still practiced at Lobmeyer today, and seems as, a, as if it is the secret of success. Strunert experimented with and introduced the thin-walled glass, the so-called muslin glass, to the collection, whilst he referred to earlier works of Ludwig Lobmeyer. The muslin glass has become one of Lobmeyer's specialities and has been constantly developed and reinterpreted by many of the designers Lobmeyer worked with. This little detour in Lobmeyer's history, to me, seems very important to understand the alliances with institutions such as the Museum of Applied uh, Art, uh, contemporary, uh, contemporary Art, as it's called today, or the Kunstgewerbeschule. And artists, as well as their design uh, phys uh, uh, philosophy. Lobmeyer now and then has become a role model for other Austrian manufacturers with a long tradition. In their design thinking, concerned with an ongoing process of reinventing themselves over and over again for generations and decades. But coming back to the Austrian Werkbund from where we have departed, it has to be concluded in retrospective that the institution like its allied the Imperial and Royal Austrian Museum of Art and Industry and the attached um, and later detached Kunstgewerbeschule, were committed rather to stylistic art, arts and crafts, and cultivating a sense of taste than bringing art and industry together. In contrast to the German Werkbund, however, the Austrian offspring only rudimentarily confronted the era's burgeoning industrial manufacturing that somehow was boosted and later on destroyed by the event of World War I. With the defeat of the Great War, Austria was facing a complete new configuration, politically, geographically, economically, and socially. The last Habsburg emperor, King Charles, resigned and Austria became a republic after the Treaty of Saint-Germain of 1919. There was nothing left of the Habsburg realm except its Alpine and Danubian provinces, which make makes roughly 40% of the former territories. Important industrial facilities, agricultural supply, skilled manufacturers and labor in the former provinces were gone. The economic situation, besides all other circumstances, uh, was disastrous. To illustrate this, I picked uh, um, a card, a map, that shows um, the production sites of Lobmeyer throughout the history, but as you can see, there is a great accumulation in Moravia and Bohemia, which at the time wasn't easy to access and will become even more difficult after World War II. The interwar years the interwar years, shaken by political, social, and economic eruptions, laid a new focus in design. However, the Bauhaus, which minted a new functional design ideology, was able to garner only scant acceptance in Austria. Friedel Dicke and Franz Singer, who both formed a studio or had a studio together, were the only Bauhaus-trained designers able to implement their ideas of a modern, direct living environment 
by offering design solutions for their open-minded and, to be honest, again, wealthy clients, and by building educational, facili and building educational facilities. Uh, following the Anschluss, uh, Friedel Dicke was deported to the ghetto in Theresienstadt, where she conducted a children's painting school be before she was sent and murdered in Auschwitz, 1942. In Vienna's municipal settlement office, run by Adolf Loos in the 1920s, Margarete Schütte-Lihotzky began to confront with the working population's impoverished living and housing situation. In 1926, Ernst May invited her along with Franz Schuster to collaborate on the residential building project New Frankfurt. Foreseeing the double burden that women would confront as employees and housewives and deeply impressed by the first rationalization studies in America, Schütte-Lihotzky developed the Fr Frankfurt Kitchen, which was the world's first standardized built-in kitchen, which we see here, and uh, which is actually currently on display at the MoMA Counter Space Design and the Modern Kitchen Exhibition. Franz Schuster was convinced of the necessity of social uh, affordable objects, and in 1929, he designed so-called unitized, unity, unitized, unitized, unitized construction furniture, modular standardized furniture, which provide a base for the average person to purchase the furniture piece by piece, as you can see to the right side. In contrast to Schutte-Lihotzky, who was arrested as a communist residence fighter and shunned, receiving almost no new commissions in post-war Austria, Schuster, who was appointed successor of Joseph Hoffmann as a professor at the Kunstgewerbeschule 1973, was able in the 1950s to pursue his idea of the social object and made a decisive contribution to the development of the project Soziale Wohnkultur, social living uh, uh, home culture, and so-called SW furnitures, which we will see examples later on. These careers are just a few representatives uh, of fa fates of numbers, numbers uh, individuals. It also reflects Austria's loss of creative potential and how the country dealt with its own history in the interwar and postwar era. Another important protagonist of this period was Joseph Frank, who was a liberal social democrat and a Jew, and consequently a victim of Austrian fascism, what made him move to Stockholm in 1934. Frank carried out a lifelong critical discourse with international modernism, condemning its dogmatic position. He emphasized the individual's complex constitution and in designing interiors and houses, he sought a model capable of expressing human fallibility and the desire to express one's personality. His idea of a more moderate modernity sometimes also referred to as uh, Divina Moderne, opened up niches for self-expression. In short, kitsch or folkloristic objects or a collection on top of a well-thought simple furniture. This interest is also expressed in his uh, textiles and uh, yeah, his interest in the vernacular and cultural um, origins are, expre expressed in, are expressed in his uh, textiles and floral patterns. In quoting traditional craft skills and reinterpreting them in a contemporary manner, he has perfect example of a designer and architect that draws from the immense richness of cultural traditions as a resource. The design firm House and Garten 
which he founded together with Oskar Vlach in 1925, was one of the first producers and stores in Vienna in which customers could buy modern individual pieces of furniture. Frank is also considered as a trailblazer, as a trailblazer in Swedish design, although one must keep in mind the already existing uh, unpretentious uh, furniture culture there. In Austria, his work and achievements were lost for several decades following his emigration. And only with the re-examination by renowned Austrian designers and architects of the 1960s, such as Josef Spalt or Frederick Kurrent and Hermann Czech, was brought back to the awareness of younger generation. Unlike Frank Schütte-Lehotzky or a teenaged Viktor Papenek, who in the 1960s and 70s uh, became prominent for his radical and social critical work, and many, many others who were forced to flee Austria after the Anschluss in 1938, there was quite a number of designers and architects who fled at an earlier stage, simply because Austria was too narrow and limited for the visionary thoughts and design approaches. Richard Neutra, Rudolf uh, Schindler, Frederick Kiesler, or Bernard Rudowski, just to name a few. A good overlook delivers uh, a book published uh, in 1995 by Matthias Böckel, which was actually a catalog to an accompanying exhibition uh, in Vienna. It's called The Visionaries in Exile. After World War II, the definition of a new Austria came about through a successful social partnership between entrepreneurs and labor representatives and through exemplary economic growth. This growth was triggered by rebuilding the, the country and meeting the population's essential needs, such as food, clothing, and shelter. Um, Yet, soon it was possible to turn to building and design new types of spaces, such as dance, um, such as dance places, and uh, quick um, and espresso shops, uh, a new establishment for uh, a quick cup of coffee, in contrast to the slow-paced, outmoded Viennese coffee house. And once again, enjoy a recreational pleasure uh, to uh, skiing, which became very important in creating a new national identity. Wolfgang Pauser, a Viennese-based cultural critique, reflects on the specific Austrian interrelation between winter sports, design, and national identity as follows. In any, inquiries, uh, in any inquiry into the development of design of Austrian products in the 20th century, the athletic conquest of the Alps, especially via skis, deserves emphasis. Austria has always played a central international role, um, always played a central international role in skiing. It is where ski products come from and school, ski tourists flock to. Yet, beyond its function as a sport, skiing also contributed to reformulating an identity after World War II, which generated considerable motivation and energy that flowed into developing ski equipment and actually a whole lifestyle and product world around it. Skiing advanced uh, to a national sport and Austria became a skiing nation that it wasn't just uh, after World War II. Um, I also brought some examples. For instance, this is um, the Oswald uh, Hertel Pavilion, built in 1937 already, where Austria drives on its alpine uh, background. And this is a, I don't know whether you can see it from the back, but it's vases from Augarten, which was actually established or re-established in 1923 um, as a state-owned uh, company. 
And by using old shapes, they applied um, winter sports uh, decoration as a new, um, also to um, achieve or uh, uh, reach a new client and, and uh, spare time or people with spare time um, activities. On a more psychological level, he, uh, Wolfgang Pauser analysis, after Austria's defeat in 1945, all of the militarily trained personnel apparently, uh, apparently needed new par parade grounds where they could execute rhythmic rank and file stem turns in orderly group formations like a fighter wing. They also needed permanent reprimanding from the mountain men Ski instructor in his red and white uniform, embellished with a national coat of arm. And finally, he comes to the conclusion, in post-war Austria, success in tourism, ski production and ski racing gave the feeling of at least having status in something, of ranking well in comparison with other countries, or even winning. Well, whether Pauser's personality profile of Austrians might be true or not, it is a matter of fact that the discovery and self-presentation of Austria as a ski and tourism nation provided the most significant, significant contribution to economic growth and the renewed identity and identity formation process, and however has remained as one of the nation's driving forces. But there was design going on off-site, the ski slopes, too. Oswald Hertel shall be named as one of the most prominent designers of that era. A student of Oskar Strinnert at Kunstgewerbeschule, he already made a name for himself in the interwar period as a designer for Austrian pavilions for the 1935 Brussels World Fair and the 1937. Paris World's Fair that we can see here. Together with Joseph Hoffman, with whom he worked with since 1927, he realized several prestigious projects in Vienna and designed for companies such as Augarten Porcelain, which was, uh, as mentioned before, newly established in 1923. And we can see here one of his um, well-known uh, so, so called Melon, uh, Melone. What's that in English? Melon, melon. melon yeah, it's the melon shaped uh, mocha and coffee service. Uh, of course, he worked for Tonnet and Loebmeyer. Uh, and here we can see uh, on the bottom the drinking service, the so called ambassador. After World War II, in addition to his work as an architect and teacher at the now renamed Academy of Applied Arts, former, formerly known as Kunstgewerbeschule, Hertel became involved in the development of an affordable popular culture. Together with Karl Auberg Sr., also a designer and architect who ran his own production work, and the artist Fritz Wotruber, they founded Österreichische Werkstätten as a hub for new Austrian craftsmanship and design, and obviously as a reminiscence to the Wiener Werkstätte that somehow never um, gained the same attention as its prominent forerunner. Hertel was responsible for presenting the first Austrian contribution to the Milan Triennale in the 1950s, and through his teaching, he shaped some kind of a post-war Austrian design style. His work represents the continuity of classical Viennese modernism. His buildings and interiors display an independent, playful, elegant signature, which also shaped his design vocabulary. He rejected overly fashionable trends. His numerous interiors, furniture, and chair designs radiate comfort and a typical Viennese flair. 
um, that you might feel when visiting uh, the Café Prickel at Vienna's Ringstrasse opposite the Museum of Applied Arts, Contemporary Arts. His design attitude made him the perfect match for the Lobmeyer Company, which in the meantime was guided by Hans Harald Rath, the son of Stefan Rath, who besides running the business in Vienna's Kärntnerstraße was involved, among others, uh, among others, uh, in building up an Austrian class industry. Due to the fact that after World War II, all the suppliers and collaborators in Bohemia and Moravia have disappeared behind the Iron Curtain. Hans Harald also designed uh, for the collection and his drinking se service number 267, which I'm missing here a slide, um, but it is upstairs in the exhibition. Uh, the so-called Alpha uh, series can be referred to as one of Austria's design classic. His starburst chandelier, and again, I think you know, and, uh, you, you know the original better than I do, uh, for the Metropolitan Opera New York of 1963, which was a gift by the Austrian Republic to the uh, United States in gratitude of their uh, engagement in building up a new Austria, made the company again uh, succeed on an international platform. Obviously, Lobmeyer glass and Augarten porcelain wasn't exactly the home decor of the majority of Austria's post-war population. More common were the interiors of Soziale Wohnkultur, or called SW furniture. As already mentioned in the context uh, with uh, Franz Schuster, especially their kitchen program in pastel colors remained in the collective <laughs> memory of the post-war generation as fittings of their parents' and grandparents' homes. Similar in color, and that is why they went well together, were the Lilian porcelain dishes. Um, Lilian porcelain goes back to the Williamsburger earthenware factory, which was purchased by a Jewish family uh, named Lichtenstern in 1883 sized by the Nazis and returned to Konrad Lester, formerly Kurt Lichtenstern. The company produced all kinds of dishes for private use and catering. It became most popular in the post-war era due to its aggressive marketing, like st street demonstrations and other advertised applications Mr. Lester brought from the States, where he has emigrated to. Its coloring met with the contemporary taste, and since the factory was not able to design the color uniformly, they came up with the intelligent idea of putting the colors together to a service that was promoted as Daisy Melange, that you see to the right side. Other ranges followed with such imaginative names like Corinna, Dora, Dolly, or Manuet, perfectly in shape with the 1950s, 60s, like the namesake beauty idols featured in one of those high spirit movies that should take away the gray shadows of the war. Out of production in Austria for almost half a century, today Daisy and her sisters became valuable items that form an obsessive community of collectors only comparable with those of Barbie dolls and Russell Wright dishes. The late 50s and early 60s represent more than just the establishment of a consumer society. They also offered, at least in isolated cases, real chances to succeed in a still unsaturated market. Yet at the same time, another typical Austrian phenomenon is that due to the poorly developed consumer goods industry, as well as low self-esteem, an ambivalent attitude toward Austrian history, it was 
primarily individual creative designers and ambitious figures from the business world that stepped to the forefront and continued to do so, like the Lobmeyer and Rudd dynasty, to shape the design scene, whereas a design identity applicable to the nation as a whole has never been de developed. Also because it has never been seen by the governmental representatives, like in other war-torn countries in Europe, as a tool for marketing and export an innovative image of a country. Sure, an Austrian design institute, uh, shortcut OEF, was for founded in 1858 uh, by the initiative of the architect Karl Schwanzer. And we see here and works of his as an association to establish industrial design as an economic factor and contributor to cultivate a broader awareness of de design's competitive and identity endowing power. Also Karl Schwanzer uh, collaborated or worked together with Lobmeier and uh, his uh, drinking set commissioned for the 1967 uh, World's Fair in Montreal is here on display. Uh, another uh, protagonist and personality in that uh, relation and context is Karl Auberg, uh, or the Auberg dynasty in general, uh, goes back to a brass uh, and metal workshop uh, through many generations of them, uh, who actually produced their designs themselves. And uh, Karl Auberg uh, Jr. later on followed Karl Schwanzer and was one of the promoters of Austrian design on an international level. However, this institution was disbanded in 1998, just with the rise and awakening of the creative industry's culture that, luckily by now, also has devotees in political ranks and a structural, structural funding in Vienna and Austria became possible that actually Vienna Design Week is highly profiting from. In the 1960s and 70s, Vienna was still, as one once before, not a worldly city. A pity and fearful society, it depleted itself by consuming goods with run-of-the-mill designs. This narrowness, coupled with a worldwide repression and local provincially, was bound to provoke radical contrapositions. Uh, Hans Hollein and Walter Pichler, although fascinated by technology, nonetheless confronted the commercialization and mechaniz mechanization of their surroundings with irony and critique. They developed collaborative uh, and individual works expressing issues relating to technological fascination as well as megalomanic fant fantasies and the repression uh, of emotional and erotic needs. Um, yeah, this is the mobile office of uh, Hans Hollein, Walter Pichler's television and uh, a work by um, Zündab. No, it's not Zündab, it's um, Hausrucker Co, The Mind Expander. <laughs> Other individuals such as Heinz Frank or groups as Hausrucker and Co, that we see the bill co uh, uh, picture, Kop Himmelblau or Zündab followed by developing poetic and playful concepts and projects and projects also challenging the boundaries between art, design, and architecture. This movement, identified as the Austrian phenomenon and somehow influenced by the even more provocative Austrian actionism or Viennese actionism, was related to radical architectural positions in England, in England like Archi Arch um, Archigram or Italy, uh, Super Studio or Archisum. For the first time since Vien uh, the Wiener Werkstätte era, 
and other individual in designers such as Hoffmann, Frank, or Loos, Vienna was again able to capture international attention. Hans Hollein, alongside his successful activities as an architect, drafted a series of design objects also for international firms such as Alessi uh, that we see uh, the so-called uh, tea and coffee piazza on the bottom left side. Also being at the forefront of a postmodern movement that fought the establishment and outmoded dispositions, he was, and still is, deeply interested in cultural history and phenomena and its interrelation with cont contemporary design. From the reading of artifacts to the transformation into contemporary objects and services. At best documented with its 1976 opening exhibition, Man Transforms, here at the Cooper Hewitt National Design Museum. The definition of design laid down in my concept, he stated in 1989 in a later documentation on the exhibition, and materialized in the show, provoked reactions, especially as there was a clear departure from the conventional attitude about product displays and values and moral judgments about good design. As much it has triggered discussion and contribution to a new view of design, which is widely accepted today. The presentation was an anthropological journey around the world into the past and present that somehow became a design methodology in today's design practice, especially when dealing with traditional and craft and manufacturers. Interestingly enough, it was also architects and not art or cultural historians who began analyzing uh, the Austrian van der Siegle and interwar architectural and design history. Here, the Arbeitsgruppe 4, the working group number four, founded in 1952 by Friedrich Kurrent, Johannes Spalt and uh, Wilhelm Holzbauer, played a pivotal role. Their publications and exhibitions made the works of Otto Wagner, Adolf Loos, Joseph Hoffmann, and Joseph Frank accessible, and ultimately helped for the international breakthrough and rediscovery in the 1970s and 80s by such major exhibitions as we've seen before uh, that was uh, designed by Hans Hollein. Um, First, the Arbeitsgruppe 4 and later only Spalt worked for Wittmann Möbelwerkstätten, a furniture manufacturer based in a wine region in Lower Austria, thus laying the foundation of the company's success. Originally founded in 1896, Wittmann, uh, Wittmann was a settler's workshop developed uh, and developed one of Austria's renowned manufacturers of high quality upholstered furniture. Together with Spalt, uh, they endeavored to obtain sole rights to reproduce Hoffmann furniture, uh, the so called recreation uh, series of Joseph Hoffmann. The collection, meanwhile, comprises more than 20 models. Wittmann's occupation with Austrian design history also continues. The reissuing, reissuing of Frederick Kiesler's avant-garde works, beginning with the Corealistic instrument that we see here on the top, um, once designed for, uh, as you might know, uh, Peggy Guggenheim's New York Art of the Century Gallery, is ongoing. Yet, this does not prevent Wittmann from seeking international-oriented quality design together with designers from around the world, including Paolo Piva, Jan, Jan Amgard, Matteo Thun, Toshiyuki Kita, or Christopher Marchand, or young Austrian design newcomers such as For Use, Polka, that we see here, or Soda designers. 
Thus, they play a lively role in the creation of a contemporary Austrian design identity based on traditional manufacturing culture. Um, I particularly choose this project at the end uh, of this uh, overview because um, in 2007, we collaborated with Wittmann on one of our Vienna Design Week projects and asked the designers Nada Nasralla and Christian Horne to work within the framework of Passionswege with, Lobmeier, uh, with Wittmann. Even so, they have been already commissioned for work for Wittmann. They were used to have very strict uh, or very narrow briefings uh, for the for the Wittmann clients. And we then just asked them to come up, uh, what would you do if you do not have a briefing uh, that suits the company's clients? And they came up uh, with this idea for outdoor, and it was, of course, the idea behind Passionswege actually is to elaborate more experimental work that is not uh, profit-oriented or uh, should uh, go into production right away. It is much more of a laboratory. And in that sense, uh, um, this laboratory, laboratory really worked because Wittmann later on took up the idea of this outdoor lounge chair and uh, set it up in their collection and it became one of their at least uh, media uh, successes. <laughs> yeah, from here I will do a major shortcut into present times, leave out the rest of a journey through Austria's design landscape that has erected over the past cent uh, two centuries. Within this short time of an evening lecture, it's only possible to give an overview anyway, a rough grid and a few uh, highlighted coordinates. I'm already aware of that I left out further important contributors. In fact, Austria's complete design history not even has been gathered in one complete written standard work yet, not in uh, German and not at all in English. Therefore, all this presentation showed blind spots Therefore, also this presentation showed blind spots such as gender aspects, because I'm sure there must have been more uh, creative women involved in that trajectory. If there is a reading, I would recommend additionally to the already mentioned book of Tulga Bayerle, A Century of Austrian Design, uh, that would be Gabriele Koller's Radikalisierung der Fantasie, Radicalization of the Fantasy, published in 18, 1987. However, uh, maybe that was at least a teaser for further interest in design, Austrian design history, or past and present. Hopefully, it might help to navigate through the Lobmeyer exhibition thereafter with another view, with an even deeper respect and understanding of how these uh, exhibited milestones, now part of the permanent, or most of them uh, part of the permanent collection here at the Cooper Hewitt National Design Museum, fit into the broader context of Austria's history from imperial to contemporary and design history in general. Now for the last part uh, of my presentation, I will show you projects um, of Vienna Design Week uh, that Vienna Design Week has initiated since its foundation in 2006. Um, the just heard prelude of the expanded past 150 years in the trajectory of Austria, Austria's ways of design may also give a backdrop for the following examples because they consciously or unconsciously carry this heritage uh, in mind. However, they certainly have been stimulated by it and not just because uh, they became reality by the skilled and skilled know-how and hands of traditional manufacturers. Um, I will start with a project uh, that we had this year 
at Vienna Design Week by a young design uh, team called Van der Sea. Um, and as I said, we, each year we set up um, at least uh, or up to 10 uh, projects of younger, more established local and international designers with uh, local manufacturers. Uh, whilst not all of them are Lobmeyers, uh, what we try to do is also to um, reach um, manufacturers or shops or retailers that are just on the urge to maybe even closing down because they don't have the clients anymore or they seem to be outdated. Uh, and in this particular se uh, case, uh, because we had a sort of a... Um, focus in this year's Vienna Design Week to go to more remote areas than rather the first district, which is, of course, a very glamorous place where Lobmeyer has his um, uh, shop in Kärntner Straße as well. Uh, and in those streets, um, there are plenty of shops that you know, are either already closing, uh, closed down and there are empty spaces or they're about to do so due to a uh, change in, uh, uh, in the society or uh, the neighborhood in general. So in this case, uh, we matched this design team with a uh, shop that actually is selling watches. It's called Chronometrie Sulzberger. And uh, the guy is actually a trained uh, jewelry maker. Uh, and... Uh, he lost interest in doing his craft and actually shifted to doing um, home, homemade wine instead. So what he's actually doing is he sits in the back of his shop and catering his friends, um, which was a very weird uh, place. Um, however, uh, the two guys um, stood up to it. And uh, I mean, in the discussion with this guy, it actually came to the surface that he was looking for something that ma matches to something prestigious as watches or time in general and has the same quality um, of timeliness in a way. So uh, they came up with an idea of a concept store in that store where they gathered uh, products, objects from surrounding manufacturers that sort of have the same fate or not, because Lobmeyer doesn't, uh, but also to bring in a very typical Viennese um, collection of items. And what you can see here is, um, yeah, this is sort of the outlines of Vienna, the center of the dome, and this is where this shop is, and all these other spots are manufacturers uh, that were represented in this store, and these are manufacturers outside Vienna that were represented in that store. And uh, those things go from homemade jam uh, to uh, brushes, Lobmeyer glasses, special knives, um, play cards. And uh, we were actually quite astonished that this shop really worked uh, as, a, as a store and people came in and bought uh, because um, these things have been put together in one place and one did not have to find them uh, in, in different places. Uh, and a product you could find um, in that shop, but actually it wasn't there, um, could have been um, animal pots uh, from the company called Ries Kelomat, which is placed in Ipschitz in Lower Austria. Uh, and it actually has uh, a very long tradi tradition and history as a metal workshop for about 400 years and is as such one of the oldest companies in Austria. Still family owned, uh, it has worked together with some of the designers that I've mentioned before. However, their classic pots that we can see here, actually this is the classic range, and this is the 50s um, 
post-war style colors that fit the kitchen and the Lilian porcelain. Um, those classics um, remained as the favorites. Uh, however, animal, um, as it was an inventive material uh, before the 20th century, uh, became kind of outdated because the material is thin and things easily burn and so on. However, um, and then of course with the invention of new materials, uh, it completely kind of uh, got out of favor and only became a an item for nostalgics. Um, but uh, somehow, somehow the Rees family seemed quite interested in working together with contem contemporary designers. And it happened that uh, Mr. Rees came to one of our um, conferences that we organized in 2006 or 2007 in that case and he met um, the uh, polka designers that we just got to know through their project with Whitman. Whitman. And he started to work with them like it, it, that was presented within a Passionswege uh, presentation of Vienna Design Week, but actually it was initiated by themselves. So, um, and, but they carried the same idea not from the beginning to work on a new product, but just finding out, you know, what is Reese about? Uh, and um, the result uh, in this collaboration, which was more of a process or a journey for the company itself, uh, were those, um, they call them mutant um, pots that, uh, and other kitchen devices that one can use or not, uh, after all, they're beautiful objects, no doubt about that. But anyway, it brought uh, the company further and they um, established, if it comes or not, oops. Um, they um, called for, um, for a small pitch of designers to come up with a new um, set of animal dishes or uh, kitchenware. And uh, in that case, it was Dottings. Uh, it's two young girls uh, that are here with the, uh, the two designers somewhere. It's the other one um, that uh, also went through the whole process in that company to um, overlook what their qualities are and what one could change um, to a more contemporary um, style. Of course, they brought in all functional aspects, uh, so the bottom became thicker and other uh, qualities the, um, uh, the dishes did not have before. However, they generated a complete new uh, identity for the company. And this was only possible through this process of uh, also getting to know each other rather than um, through some marketing um, surveys. Another company uh, within uh, that uh, long tradition of Austrian crafts and manufacturers is Augarten Porcelain, as mentioned before. It was founded uh, by the Austrian state as Wiener Porzellanfabrik AG uh, for the renewal and continuation of the former state porcelain manufactory, later renamed to Wiener Porzellanmanufaktur Augarten. Since its founding in Schloss Augarten, the now private-owned firm. It was uh, sold in 2003 to a private uh, entrepreneur. Uh, um, the foundation at the time of uh, uh, Augarten was together with um, members of the Wiener Werkstätte, as we got to know already, Joseph Hoffmann, 
Michael Povolny and others. Um, and it has produced, uh, yeah, here we can see the Melon uh, service uh, again, and on the top there is uh, Michael Povolny service, and uh, uh, designs, post-war designs by Ursula Klassmann, and uh, what Augarten is, of course, uh, famous for are there figurines and figures uh, from the 17th and 18th, uh, uh, from the 18th and 19th century. Its origins uh, of uh, Augarten go back uh, as far as 1718, when Claudius Innocentius du Parquier was granted the sole right to manufacture porcelain within Austria uh, at the time by Emperor Karl VI. In 1864, the manufactory had to close due to the overpower of competitors from Bohemia and Moravia and other provinces of the Austro-Hungarian, by then becoming Austro-Hungarian Empire. And uh, yeah, it was reopened in 1923 uh, by the new Austrian uh, state. Uh, here again, um, of course, uh, the company has a tradition of collaborating, and actually that, that was the reinvention uh, uh, in the post-war or uh, interwar years. Um, we, within the last couple of years, um, they tried, I mean, in general, all the uh, ceramic and porcelain industry is declining, uh, as one can imagine, due to industrial production sites that are much more cheaper. So those manufacturers have to think about, since it is so labor intensive, uh, how can we actually reinvent ourselves? And uh, in this particular case, we also asked um, young designers to look at the processes and um, experiment with uh, uh, manufacturing um, steps by steps. Uh, in that case, it was Marco Desi, and uh, he's actually Italian or South Tyrol, based in Vienna. And he went through the different um, phases uh, in the creating of an Augarten object, which is from forming to glazing. Uh, and he actually did not design a new shape, but he just uh, left out parts or steps in this process and came out with very um, yeah, poetic, beautiful um, uh, objects um, that kind of refer to the history of the company. This collaboration was actually a uh, start or a spin-off for uh, further collaboration between the two of them. And uh, now uh, Marco Desi is actually working on a new service for Augarten, which is quite outstanding because the investment for all the forms and so on is quite intensive. And uh, due to this process they had, in creating this special editions for Passionswege, it happened that the manufacturer or the product manager and uh, Marco Desi um, figured out that there is uh, a good link between them and also that Desi has uh, the sense to work with porcelain, which isn't uh, that easy to find. Another very a uh, different, uh, a very different approach uh, in the following year was done by um, Marei Wollersberger, who is an Austrian trained at the RCA in London at uh, Design Interaction. And she made, um, she thought about uh, what is the manufacturer of the, f uh, of the future. And her scenario was um, the porcelain manufacturer of the future is a therape therapeutic service provider who is not only concerned about functional and aesthetic aspects, 
but um, cater for conscious and subconscious emotional needs of the clients through individual products made for specification. And I mean, that is nothing very special because most of the service services of Augarten have been done for a very spe specific client and most of the time actually goes into um, this ordering process uh, in shapes, ornaments, ornamentation and so on. So that might as well be kind of a therapeutic um, coming together. Um, she actually uh, came up with two sort of um, ideas. One of them was the empath uh, Empathic Coffee Cups series. And it's a series of coffee cups based on psychological profiles. They show how the porcelain manufactory of the future take account of complex needs and ambiguities. And I just um, pick out three examples. So um, this one uh, is for people with A, D, and D. Keeps the coffee drinker suffering from attention deficit disorder focused by directing his or her attention on balancing the cup constantly to avoid the spilling of the content. That one is for hyperkinetics. Uh, it increases uh, the likelihood of the nervous and uncoordinated coffee drinker to get hold of a handle by five. And this one down here uh, is for misanthropists. Uh, it prevents contemptuous coffee drinker, drinkers to avoid eye contact with fellow human beings. <laughs> and actually, uh, this is a special one because it has a hole. And this is for anthropo uh, anthropophobes. Um, and it presents uh, the shy coffee drinker to avoid eye contact whilst it, re it remains possible to observe uh, other coffee house visitors <laughs> through the peephole. I mean, this is something that might seem obscure, but actually all those people you're gonna find in a Viennese coffee house. Um, and she actually went further. Another um, service that she introduced was the autobiographical coffee service. It's based on the principle of the family constellation. Uh, it is an example of a coffee service uh, for a person who identifies with the protagonist of Kafka's um, the metamorphos, uh, of Kafka's metamorphosis, Gregor, uh, Gregor Samsa, who uh, defeatly ple pledges his life to his family despite their estrangement after his transformation in a giant insect. So uh, the milk jar here uh, is the mother. She's weak, she's avoiding confrontation, and she hides in the shadow of a big funnel. This is the father, passive, aggressive, and domineering, he claims the most space of the family table. And this is Gregor Samsa himself. The pro protagonist itself acts selfless on the dutiful and dutiful. Literally, he's carrying the burden of the family on his legs. And the last piece is the sister, the sugar sprinkler. She's superior, uh, sacrosanct, and she emerges as the star of the family. Yeah, quite different uh, concepts, and certainly this was one of the more, more um, futuristic ones. Um, 
I, I want to end uh, the lecture with examples uh, that we, or project that we did together with Lobmeyer within Vienna Design Week. And uh, actually our collaboration is long, longer as Vienna Design Week because we already did a pilot prior to Vienna Design Week and Lobmeyer was one of our partners there. In that year, we invited Martino Gamper uh, to work with Loebmeier, and he literally locked himself into the workshop of Loebmeier for one and a half day. And he very spontaneously came up uh, with a whole setting of ideas that were, and actually he was uh, in the uh, Chandelier workshop. Uh, he came up with different ideas um, deriving from the material of leather that is one of the uh, basic materials in, in, uh, in the chandelier making, also because the chandelier making comes from the settlers, uh, settler making business. And he um, did uh, also chandeliers where he put in some of the, um, yeah, some of the glasses uh, upside down, he made very simplistic, almost Lossian, um references. Um, he also brought the people from the workshop into the um, into the shop of uh, Lobmeier in Kärntner Straße. And one of the nicest ideas, ideas that derived was this sort of leather coasters that create um, a family, no matter whether you have a Lobmeier class or not, uh, which is kind of a quite contemporary approach because uh, formally one would order a set of six or 12 uh, glasses, but in our two days constellation, maybe we're just fine with two. And then we start adding and sampling uh, either uh, Lobmeyer glasses or other uh, glasses from Ikea or where else. And the only, what brings them together besides the coaster is that they all get an engraving that kind of have a code similar um, to the coast uh, to the outlines of the co coaster. Uh, another approach was uh, Maxim Velchowski. He actually um, took this experimental approach very serious. He um, started maybe from his, I mean, he's Prague based, and uh, we all know there is the Latina Magica. And he started to browse through the depots of Lobmeyer of uh, spare parts of chandeliers, vases, and objects. And out of these objects, he created these amazing skylines. Um, yeah, here as New York, Moscow, uh, and other cities uh, where Lobmeyer chandeliers are placed. And as a matter of fact, with this became so popular that later on the Vienna Board of Tourism commissioned an extra made set of these boxes uh, to travel around the world as a yeah, um, advertisement for, for Vienna. Another approach uh, was uh, Max Lambs, a British-based designer who more with a rational analysis worked on the value of crafts, uh, of crafts labor. And this within uh, Loebmeier's uh, manufacturing processes like engraving, uh, glass cutting, blowing. And um, in this first series, he just started, uh, so he was actually questioning what makes the price of a piece. And uh, here he started with engraving dots by dots, and uh, each dot added uh, 25 cents to it. And uh, yeah, the value um, of this uh, object line raises enormously, uh, whilst, for instance, in that case, every single piece is the same because um, uh, it's one off pieces and uh, might remember it's uh, the alpha shape that he just left the, I don't know how you call it in English, but it, he also just took it out of the, the blowing process. Whilst here in the cutting uh, process, 
the pieces at the outer front uh, are the more expensive ones because it's harder uh, or it's more difficult when the material is very thick or when the material becomes very thin, while in the middle it gets uh, average. Also, within this collaboration, um, the match uh, continued into a further project, and now Max Lamp is uh, designing or just uh, released this um, sets of tumblers. And last but not least, uh, a project that came uh, out this year with the German designer Mark Braun, also a project about um, wealth. So we had value before, now it was wealth. And certainly Austria is rich of water. And so he drove on this uh, idea and he got his inspiration from Google Earth images where he spotted um, glaciers, rivers, lakes in Austria and transferred them uh, on um, onto the glass. And so here we have Attersee, we have Bodensee, um, can't remember that one. That's the Danube. That's the Moor, very thin outlines, and those are glaciers. Um, that's the Stubayer glacier, the Patzwerke, and others. Yeah. So I think um, that's a perfect end for this journey uh, in and around Austria. Um, I hope it uh, kind of gave you an idea of uh, what Loebmeier in terms of contemporary design meant in the past and uh, in the present. And um, if you have any questions, I'm just now ready to Thank you. I think we just have time. Unfortunately, we are going to apparently have to uh, the, uh, build. We have a certain amount of time on the on the building. So I think if just we have time for maybe one or possibly two questions, quick questions. If anybody has any, I think there's so much food for thought. It may take us a while <laughs> to realize the kind of questions we'd like to ask. But does anybody? Well, thank you. Thank you very much. It was, as I said, it was really like uh, both connecting the past and the present, realizing that innovation is innovation in all periods, and seeing what present-day designers are connecting with in the past. And through the eyes of Lohmeyer and others, it's very interesting to put their work in context. So I think this will definitely will want to rush back into the exhibition and look at it with new eyes. Thank you. So maybe you should get some of the current pieces as well for your oh, collection. Oh, we do have, we have, there are a number. Yeah, yeah there are a number. We have the polka and we yeah. have uh, Einhorn and, there are num and there's some others that are not in the exhibition. Ted Muling felt that he was working, the bulk of the theme was going to be about the drinking set and drinking um, vessels. Yeah. And so some of the things that are of all periods, including the contemporary, that are vases or other other types of object are not in the show. The collection that we acquired has about another 30 or 40, ob 40 objects in it that are just not in the exhibition. Yeah. Right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.